The 92nd episode of Elizaviews Whining About Movies is brought to you by the first annual Intergalactic Imagination Connoisseurs Film Festival. Entries are open till December 1st. Tell me you've got started on making your own movie. You haven't? Why not? Here's your chance. You can be in a film festival. It'll be fun. You should do it. Come on. You should. Come on. Well, we begin our Bondathon. Our Bondathon. Our Bondathon. Uh, talking about a Bond movie from every single actor who played James Bond in the official series. So we're not going to go back and watch Casino Royale. That was on American television where Barry Nelson played Jimmy Bond. Oh. And I Peter Lorre played Le Chiffre. And we're not going to watch um, the 67 J James Bond parody with David Niven, Casino Royale, the, the second Casino Royale. And oh, then there's I the third. Seen any of those. Well, then we're going to watch not the third Casino Royale, but Skyfall. Yes. So that's your uh, favorite. <laughs> my favorite. But tonight we're going to talk about one of my favorite James Bond movies, of course, Goldfinger. Goldfinger. Directed by Guy Hamilton, the third Bond film that came out in 1964. They released Doctor No, From Russia with Love, and Goldfinger in uh, three successive years. Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, and your Sommelier of Cinema. But enough about me. You know who you want to hear from. You haven't seen her in a week. It's been a week, it's my been God. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. This is the 92nd episode of what? Who are you? I am Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell. I am the ace, the arbiter of cinematic excellence, and... The Enchantress, the Enchantress of, of entertainment. entertainment. Well, you certainly dress the part. You look lovely this <laughs> evening, my dear. I wore as much gold as I could find. Wow. I've got the biggest gold earrings that I own. Do you love only gold? I love gold. You love gold? I love gold. Do you gold. love gold as much as Aura Goldfinger does? I do. Really? I want some gold bricks. Gold bricks. <laughs> what would you do with gold bricks? Would you smelt them down and make them part of, like walls of your, your Duesenberg? I don't know. I would put them all around the bedroom, and I would just, I'd put them in the bed. And like in Diabolic, I, would you lay all over? Yeah, Instead I of would. money, you'd lay all over yes, your gold bullion? I would. I would roll around on top of my gold bricks. Wouldn't it be sort of uncomfortable? They'd be hard? I don't care. Okay. Well, I, I think uh, with that, we should start talking about uh, movies and wine. And we have to have wine to talk about wine. Deloach, Heritage Reserve, Pinot Noir. We love our Pinots on this show. Wow, Pinot Noir. Yep. Why don't you give me your glass there, and little look, sister? There's a gold fleur de lis on a there. A fleur de lis, whatever you desire, if you are a fan of LA Confidential. Um, well, here you go. And ooh, I've noticed these are new wine glasses. New wine glasses. Wow, what happened to our old ones? We broke them all. They all broke. We are wine, well, you're a wine glass serial killer. I'm not. You are. You broke two. Zoe breaks all the rest. <laughs> That's because she shouldn't be drinking wine. These and are then, these are wider. Yes, they're wide. Little little uh. Yeah, little, let, let's let's Caught get a little bit here. more snort there, huh? A little bit more. There we go. A little snort. Um, well, oh, we have to drink to this fantastic film, my favorite of the Connery Bonds. I'd have to rewatch. It's been so long. I, well, I really. I wouldn't know which one's my favorite. This is peak. This is peak Connery. Oh, he's so. Oh, he oh. slaps girls on the ass, gets okay. away with it. Yeah, but I it's mean, fantastic. Come on, man. When you're Sean Connery. I know your favorite. Mm. Mm. Speaking of Sean Connery, a drink to Mr. Oh, Connery. Heartbroken. Celebrating his life, he lived a very, very long, very. Uh, successful life yeah and uh he owned a golf course he owned a football team he did it all he was zed he was he was zed rest in peace sean you brought us a lot of pleasure over the years For you're sure. bashed <laughs> right losers always talk about their the best lisp ever in history winners go home and fuck the prom queen mm. well elizabeth you know, by 1964, the three Bond films, Dr. No from Russia with Love and Goldfinger, had become the Avengers movies, the Marvel movies of their day. They were monstrously successful. Yeah. When this movie came out, it played 24 hours a day. 
And w what are your impressions of the Bond franchise in general? And do you remember what your first James Bond movie was in a movie theater? Oh, in a movie theater. Uh, that I don't know. But I remember being very young and watching, I think it was the Roger Moore films is what I started with. Um, on ABC TV. On TV. With my dad. My dad absolutely loved James Bond. And so my brother and I and my dad, we would watch. <clears throat> anytime there was a James Bond movie on, we would watch it. Now, did your dad talk about the fact that he basically escaped from an Eastern Bloc country under communist control? <laughs> did he love, did he see Bond as a liberator, a cold warrior that was fighting for all of our freedom? Is Maybe that why he loved he James did. Bond? I don't know. I We never talked about that. But well, you told me that he escaped from Serbia, right? He did. He did escape. Yes, he did. He he snuck over the border into France. I mean, they ended up in France, and that's where he met my mother. He lived there for three years and swept my mom off her feet, the little French girl, and um, brought her here. Brought her to Cleveland. To Cleveland, where so there, there was an enclave of Serbian... Uh, it was Yugoslavia back then, so yeah. it was... Uh, you know, Yugoslavian enclave, which was both Croatians, Yugoslavians, and, and all the other smaller countries that that, you know, region was, Yugoslavia was made of. But he loved these films. He loved these Did your films. dad ever, like, bitch and moan and complain about the Russians and the Cold War and, like, Khrushchev and... Um, no, he, my, my father was very um, respectful of... Of communist leaders? No, 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 no. Like he escaped in a communist country. I know. But um, he wouldn't. He wouldn't bash on anything or anyone. Uh, but he did have, you know, he had strong um, political opinions. But he was just very tactful about it. He was a very, very intelligent, very articulate man with a really cool Serbian accent. With a really cool. How, <laughs> what is a cool Serbian? Can you do one? I can't do one. Oh, okay. Well, just thought I'd ask. I can't do one. So this film really has it's it's a standalone adventure. Bond is not involved with Smirsh or Spectre. He's not he's going after an individual guy, uh Ara Goldfinger, mm -hmm. who who's a Brit even though he doesn't sound like one, played by Gert Frobe, the actor. He's supposed to be I thought he was having I thought he had like a uh, German accent. Well, yes, but he's supposed to be a Brit. They say uh, Felix Leiter says he's a Brit. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know. And about that. and um. I just thought he. Was, I just assumed he was. Gert Frobe was dubbed, or Gert Frobe. I don't know if Frobe or Frobe. Was dubbed. He was dubbed. His voice is dubbed. Why? In the movie, I guess they just didn't like his his original so they voice. They dubbed him with a German accent. Yeah, they well they had another actor come in and do his voice. Why didn't they just do a British accent? I don't He's know. He's supposed to be British. I don't know. That's that makes a very, no sense. That's a very... Well, I'm just saying. So why don't you tell us, uh, what is this movie about? Standalone. I mean, this this movie begins in, um, I, I guess, it, I don't know if it's Cuba or it's in, I forget, if it's in the Caribbean. Yeah, no, it starts in, yeah, either Cuba or it It looks like a, a, a Latino, Spanish... <laughs> well, yeah, you're... I you're, don't know if it's because they the, don't say, do they? I don't think they say exactly where they're at. But, yeah. But uh, so Bond, the so pre-title sequence, he's uh, as he says, he's 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 thwarting some warlord from financing his revolution with heroin flavored bananas. <laughs> right. And it's 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 a classic. I mean, one of the great. I, I think this is the first what I would call epic Bonds, where I mean, Doctor No's got some epic stuff in it, but. From yeah. Russia with Love is really a spy thriller. Yeah, yeah. But then this, it begins with a duck in the water. And you see a duck in the water and then... Right, right, it, which it, was really cool. You see the duck, it's like swimming and then and then all of a sudden it comes out of the water and it's like attached to a, a helmet and a person comes out of the water with a gun and everything. And, and it's and Bond. It's James Bond. And he's in this cool like neoprene wetsuit and he invades a secret base that's that's it looks it, it what's interesting it's got that great ken adam production design the secret base and they're they're making heroin and he uses <laughs> plastic explosives or whatever yep and then he blows it up and then goes to he, a, a club where right, there's a belly he dancer just walks, like he of course he's always dressed to the nines puts on a beautiful suit well that's he hasn't put it on it's underneath his wetsuit oh, that's right he takes the wetsuit off and he's got his suit on completely 
only Bond, and, and it's a great white suit. He just looks great. He's even where he, there's a, there's a moment he comes up with a carnation. Yes, is it a carnation oh or a rose? Yeah. Where he came up with that, I don't know, but he puts it right in. It doesn't matter. It's James Bond. It doesn't matter. Like he's uh, he wow, wow. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite tuxes of the Bond oh, franchise. Okay. The tux he's wearing with the white jacket. Yeah. The gray suit he wears later on, the three piece gray suit. Well, that's they make that they make that action figure, which I didn't get. Oh, it's, what? They, I know I I couldn't oh. afford the Bond set. Oh my god! I'm, I Is need it. Still it. available? No, you have to get it. I, I didn't get it because it was quite expensive. They make odd job. Uh, you have so many figures, and you didn't get that one. <sighs> Well, babe, you, you why know, why didn't you not not get some of these other ones and get because these are older. What? The... Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, some of the recent ones. Well, okay, okay. Like, like that giant Hulk Buster. You could have gotten James Bond instead. Uh, no, because they don't allow the layaway plan. Big Chief doesn't. I did get the live and let die figures. I don't care. I don't. He's not my favorite. I thought Roger. Moore, I know. Okay, but I'm oh, just saying. Wait, I was mixing that up with um. The one I don't like is... I don't like Timothy Dalton. Well, we'll talk about that when we get to Living Daylights. <laughs> but um, and why don't you like Timothy Dalton? I, I just... I, he... I don't know. I, I haven't seen it in so long. Maybe... I, I like Timothy I Dalton. To, I, I think he's to, a good... I need to rewatch Living it. Living Daylights but... is a very underrated Bond film. But anyway, so yeah. back to Gold Goldfinger. So he blows this up, and he meets his contact, and then... One of the great things about these movies that are definitely not politically correct. Um, Bond goes in. He's going to leave to... Uh, he's going to go back to Miami in an hour. Right. And he's like, oh, there's something I have to do first. So he goes... <laughs> he goes Bond style. Like, he's got he's got an hour to kill. Yeah. So he's going to go get a little something, something. Yeah, yeah. The, the dancing girl, of course. He walks in. She's, she's in, in the bathtub. She's in the bath. And what and, happens? And um, he hands her a towel. And, of course, they're getting it on. And um, he... He, um, in in the reflection in her eye, he sees a guy. As they're making out. As they're making out. They're kissing. And in the reflection of her eye, he sees a guy approaching with uh, some kind of club or yeah, something. He's going to club Bond in the head. Yeah. So what does Blonde do? He uses the girl as a shield and the guy bonks her in the head. Beautiful. Wow. That wouldn't happen today. <laughs> Although she did... She did, like, um, you know, she was in on that. Well, she was in on it. She was in on it. So, did you, that, so does she that mean she, she deserved Oh, she, okay, I'm glad. But she you... didn't die, so. Right, so it's and okay. it's not like he hit her. It's like the other dude hit her. But he did turn her so that. Yeah, he could have pushed dude... her away, but he, he he had her take the blow for he him. He had her, yeah, which I was, was kind of shocking to me. But awesome, nonetheless. Bond does what he has to do. Everyone is expendable as long as he can com complete his mission. Yeah. Although in this case, he didn't get to complete his mission because the only reason he was in that girl's room was to get a little something, <laughs> something before something, he went something. back to Miami. Yes, just like him. Uh, and then, and then, of course, Bond escapes. He he knocks a a heater into the bathtub, killing and killing the uh, wh whoever that guy was, killing the thug the that basher. was going to take him out. P shocking, positively shocking. <laughs> shocking. A great witty Bond moth that he throws yeah. out there, and then bang. Shirley Bassey comes on her big brassy song, her oh, brassy voice. My God, John this... Barry's score. I mean, the music for these movies is just amazing. It and is this amazing. This song in particular is it's one probably of the, the most classic Bond songs of all. Oh my goodness! I mean, and everyone once you knows hear us. it. You just can't get it out. Of now, your can head. you sing us a little bit? I don't sing well. Come on, but... give us a little. Just say the title <laughs> of the movie. Yeah, now. Oh, gold yeah. finger. <laughs> He's a man, the man with the mightiest touch. Come on, that was pretty good. Do the wah 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 again. <laughs> Such a cold finger <laughs> beckons you to enter his web of. <laughs> but don't go in. Um, uh, such a good song. So good. The the first of three. Shirley Bassey uh, theme songs. She sang the title track for Diamonds Are Forever and for Moonraker mm -hmm. in 1979. So, and she was going to sing uh, another Bond song, I believe, it was either for Quantum of Solace or something else, but didn't didn't make the cut. Oh, wow, too bad. I know, too bad. So after that great opening credit sequence, not by M Maurice uh, Binder, but I think it's Robert Brownjohn. I think that this is the last of Robert Brown John's credit sequences, and 
Maurice Binder came on for Thunderball, I think. Yeah. A pretty, a pretty yeah, thing. Yeah, the credit sequences, too, are just amazing in these films. Amazing. Although, in this credit sequence, they are showing you scenes that you're going to see in the movie. Yeah, but projected onto a golden face. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 they became their own thing a little later. I mean, they're their own thing now, but they, they, they made a little bit bigger design leaps. By the time you get to Daniel Kleinman's opening credits for Casino Ro- uh, for Goldeneye in 1995, they'd become... Oh, they loved my, uh, my trumpet sounds. <laughs> so, so then what happens? We meet Bond in Miami. He's at the Fountain Blow, Blau, Fountain Blau, Fortin Blau, Fountain Blau Hotel. The best hotel in Miami, Bond says. He's on vacation. Mm -hmm. He is rocking a baby blue terry cloth two-piece outfit. With really, really short shorts. Short shorts and a top. Oh, my God. I mean, look at him. Yeah. And I used to have... um... I used to have something like that that had the same same kind of little metal uh, clip for the for the belt buckle. Really? Exactly the same kind of belt buckle. Wow! But Bond was rocking this one. Oh my God! Yes. And Bond's on vacation, and Felix Leiter, his his good friend in the American, his counterpart in the CIA, Felix Leiter meets him. Yeah. And says, "Listen, dude, uh, been contacted by England. You got a job. You got to look after this guy, Auric Goldfinger." Yes. Who happens to be there at the hotel. The hotel. So maybe M yeah. booked him into that hotel on, on purpose. purpose. Uh, so we see that. And what does Bond discover Goldfinger doing? He's he's cheating, uh, playing cards, and, and winning tons of money off of um, these really rich dudes. And Bond figures out the way he's cheating is he's being fed information from his own hotel room. Yeah, well, he's wearing an earpiece, and that's kind of weird. You think, what is that? Maybe he's hard of hearing. Yeah, but a, a hearing aid doesn't have a, a cord that goes down into your shirt. And Bond figures he triangulates anyway, where... Well, he goes up to the hotel room and gets the uh, cleaning lady to open the door. And it's so great. It's another moment, actually. Oh, it's so gorgeous. When Felix meets Bond, he's getting a massage from Dink. Yeah. The girl Dink, this another hot babe. I will forgive it because it's the 60s. It is, but it's so but I, great. It really, you really forget. He turns her around and slaps how, her ass. Yeah, you really forget how, how you know, what what is the right word? How? Well, uh, people would say now that the, these are horrible examples of the patriarchy establishing its dominance uh, and that it's all, it's just very misogynistic. It is. It is misogynistic. Or it's awesome, depending on how you want to look at it. Well, w- watch, you know, d- yeah. Maybe you shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that? No. Well, like you said, it was the 60s, man. It was the 60s. I mean, you liked Mad Men. I love Mad Men. I don't but, think anyone... But there were strong women characters in that show. Well, Dink is an entrepreneur. She has her. She's working for the hotel. She's massaging James Bond. He probably gets the best masseuse. She right. probably gets paid well. I'm sure you had MI6 tip her heartily. Sure. And he slaps her ass and sends her on her way. And yeah. Felix Felix briefs him that he's got to look after Goldfinger. And then, and then when he's going into Goldfinger's suite, and he yeah. said he he, he he grabs, he just pulls aside. He pulls the, the girl over and uses her key. And what does he say to her like, when he opens the door? Oh, you're you're so sweet. You're very sweet. You're very sweet. Like he's he's lessening the blow. He's trying to trying to like he has got mm-hmm. that much charm and charisma. She's not going to go report him. And what does he find on the balcony? So he goes in, and on the balcony is another girl, Jill Masterson. Yeah, and she's looking through um, binoculars. Durbin, in Serbian, Durbin. Binoculars. <laughs> binoculars. And, do you speak Serbian? Yes. So you've never spoken Serbian on this show. Uh, no. How would you say I love James Bond in Serbian? I don't, I'm not speaking Serbian on the show. Well, maybe if we have 40,000 subscribers, you will. Is that is that the... Okay, but I have to say that I speak French fluently, and I don't speak Serbian fluently. Not anymore. All my Serbian family is passed away, so I really but, haven't had anyone to talk But with. you remember the Serbian word for binoculars. Yeah, because my dad would say... He, always, he would say, Durbin, Durbin. Which was it was a funny thing in high school. He would always, uh, yeah. It, it was a, it was an inside joke, I guess. Well, so Bond thwarts Goldfinger from cheating. Yeah. And at the same time, seduces Jill Masterson, 
and uh, takes her back to his room. He does. And they're drinking. Well, but before that happens, he talks into the earpiece um, that Goldfinger is listening and tells him that he has to lose um, $15,000 or he was going to turn him in. And so, um, yeah, then he takes the girl back to his room. What I really love about this is that here's here's Auric Goldfinger, a very rich man. He owns smelting plants across Europe, and yet he still cheats at cards. Right? He has to make himself feel better by 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 plucking a pigeon, you know. Uh, uh, apparently, somebody he knows or does business with, and he does it by lying. I mean, yeah. what is more what is more despicable than that? Right. You're just a lying cheat. He's a lying cheat. He's a lying cheat. And I love that that, that not only is he a, a large man, but he's just a... he's just a, And he's always wearing, like, golden colored things. He loves gold. Hair is blondish and, yeah. So, and then, of course, Bond takes gold. her back, takes Jillie Masterson back to her room. I love gold, but I don't cheat at cards. I win fair and square. I said Jillie, it's Jill Masterson. I was mixing up Jillie and Ghibli and... With Tilly, who we meet later. <laughs> so, so, and then what happens? Okay. Bond, Bond finally gets a little something, something. He missed the girl in yeah. the club. He had to leave Dink by herself. Now he's got his third girl yeah, in the movie. He steals Goldfinger's girl and gets a little something, something. Well, no, Jill. Jill says they they. He just pays her to be seen right. with him, and they don't do anything else. Right. Which this makes him very happy. Yeah. Well, he. He asks this question a couple of times in this movie. He's like, "If you slept with the villainous guy, I am your 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 persona non grata to me." Yeah. I like the fact that he asks. He doesn't want to dip his wick somewhere that he, you know, he's not real <laughs> sure. Like Bond has to make sure. Is that all? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's got to have like he he can he has a sense for who he can go. You know. He has some morals. No, he, no, no, he wants, well, he has, yes, but in a way, sure. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, like, I don't want to use the phrase I was going to use, but I, do I, I, but I'm just, I think it's interesting the way that, that you see that Bond has standards, like he has to make sure that she didn't sleep with Goldfinger first. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, good, come back to my room. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. I, I, I love it so much. Yeah. But then... But then getting a second bottle of Dom Perignon proves perilous for Bond. Right. Where someone finally gets the drop He's on so him. He's so snobbish. He doesn't want to drink the one that's in the um, ice bucket because it's warmed up. It's not the right temperature. You can't drink a Dom Perignon 53 above 38 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows that. So he goes to get another bottle and this guy comes up behind him and bonks him in the head. <laughs> Bonks him in the head. Bonk, bonk. Which you know bears the you want to ask yourself how did how did anybody know where he was? Right. Because Goldfinger and him haven't met, but exactly. that's okay. Exactly. <clears throat> there are a few. Um, there are a few. continuity issues. No, you yeah. just go with it because Goldfinger go. pays I, I people. Mean, it's Sean Connery, first of all, and James Bond, and so and Sean Connery as James Bond, and all you want to do is look at him. Okay, I mean, I like the fact that you know he's not too yoked. But he looks like he's fit. He's very fit. He's very fit, but he looks fit like in a real way. Like nowadays when you see people that are fit in movies, they're too fit. Well, because, because okay, back in the in the 60s, nobody was overweight. Everyone was slim. It was before all this junk food appeared on the market. So like most me. people were really slim, naturally, you know? And so he wasn't, like, really bulky, but he was, like, very nicely shaped. Yes, but he was a former bodybuilder in real life. Really? Yes. So, no, he was. But I, I love the way he looks. Even though you can you can tell his hair is thinning in this movie. Yeah, but who cares? But he's got the great, he's got the great, like, the great, ch I never had chest oh, hair. Yes. He's got the great chest, chest hair. hair. It's fantastic. In, it's not in right now. Like, all guys, like, they shave their chest. But back then. We don't just like, shave our chest, baby. What's up? Yeah, okay. Back then hairiness was, you know, you know, desirable. It was manly. It was manly. It's more Neanderthal. <laughs> it was good. I'm 4% Neanderthal by the way. Maybe that's why I like hairy dudes. Oh, there you go. It's part of your past. Your evolutionary uh, your your you 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 have to be with them. Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, I'm not Neanderthal. Well, I don't know. I've never well, taken a yeah, genetic. We I, all are. I we guess all so. Are. Well, do you know that Neanderthals were um, at war with Homo sapiens for over a hundred thousand years? Apparently, they were at war. How yeah. do we know this? I read an article about it. I, I tweeted it this week. But apparently, they were like getting it on because if we have Neanderthal in us, well, you know, you capture spoils of war. And apparently, I mean, I would argue that we're still at war with Neanderthals, but that's a whole different show. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Bond gets bonked on the head, and what does he discover? Yeah, when he wakes up, when he comes to, he um, finds uh, the girl painted in gold. In a very iconic image, Jill Masterson has been painted in gold, and she's dead. She's dead because her skin can't breathe under her the Her skin paint. can't breathe. As Bond tells us, if you leave, you know, next time I paint a girl in gold, I will remember... To leave the bottom of her spine, I'll leave square. that square so so her skin can breathe. Oh, okay. Yeah, you should remember that. You know. <laughs> so, and, and then, of course, Bond is recalled. He goes to London, and he, he goes back to the offices of MI6 to get a briefing from M, and M invites him to a dinner. Yes. Uh, where he has to meet the, the, the Treasury Secretary or whomever. Yeah. But not before flirting with Money Penny. Yeah. Money Penny, a woman always in waiting. She's flirt, flirting hard with him. She wants she wants Bond to drop that D so hard. She does. All the way into her middle age. Yeah. Why not? Why wouldn't you flirt with Lois Bond? Maxwell? Come on, man. I know, but she pines away from for him Did all the, the way on... up through. Yeah, but it's mostly like in it's it's she's being cute. I know she's being cute. But you could say nowadays she'd be like, she'd go to HR for harassment. I know. Bond would report her for harassment and she'd well, go no to HR. no one's allowed to flirt anymore, so. Which is sad. Yeah, it is. They've bled out any kind of fun in our society. Yeah. You know, everyone's turning into into asexual beings of, of that are non-gender specific. It's true. But they should watch old Bond films because then they should realize how things are really done. Well... <laughs> I don't know about that. So anyway, so what Bond is briefed. He's told that Goldfinger is a he loves gold and he has smelting facilities throughout Europe. Right. And he's now being suspected of a small a small uh what's the word? You know, what I want to say smuggling large quantities of gold bullion. Right. And they don't know how he's doing it. Right. So he's dispatched mm. to go find out. Yes. And and they give him a, they give him a bar of Nazi, if, if, if to add insult to injury, Nazi gold. Yeah, Nazi gold. It's got a stamp of the swastika. And there's on it. like 600 bars of this gold. Yeah. And, and of course. Where did they get it? They found it, like in a wreck or something, at the bottom of the river, or I don't know, someplace. Yeah. So they give him this bar of gold. And then it, one of my favorite scenes in any Bond film, because I grew up in a family where our religion was golf. <laughs> And, and and they spent a long time on the golf course. It's so great, but it's again. I mean, they show you every shot. It's so great, <laughs> and Bond meets Goldfinger. It's a setup, and they play. And on the seventeenth hole, I think it's maybe sixteenth or seventeenth hole, Bond reveals they're going to up the stakes. Bond reveals he's got this bar of gold, and Goldfinger's all beside himself. And in this whole sequence, they show Goldfinger cheats. He, you see, Odd Job is manservant. Odd Job is cheating. Oh, is that his name? Yeah, Odd Job. Odd Job. And for some reason, it, it, uh, Goldfinger has his entire uh, operation is staffed by Koreans. Yeah. You know, now I don't know if they're North Koreans because this is this is post Korean War, so I I got the impression that maybe everybody was these are former communists from North Korea. I don't remember. I I've, it's been so long since I read the book. Oh, well, does it matter? I think it does matter. They're his minions. They're his minions. But the thing is, if you if you know your Korean War history, in 1950, the communist North Koreans one day just sne snuck across the border and captured Seoul, like in a few days. And then that's when we got involved and eventually right. pushed them back, and then it came back and forth. But but yeah, man, I mean, the, the Koreans, the North Koreans were sneaky motherfuckers back then. Yeah, but what does it matter if these Koreans are from the north or the because south? Because they work 
because the South are our allies. We were, we came to their aid. The North so were then communists. Northern, um, you know, North Koreans. They're, yeah. Which means they're communists. Which which is kind of interesting which is coming why on the heels they, of they are his minions. Right. I know. So they're they're North Koreans. They're not South Koreans. Okay. Fine. They're North Koreans. They are. I think. It, and 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 they're all villainous. They are. I mean, you could you could talk about how maybe maybe it's problematic their portrayal, but I understand. If I was in North Korea, a communist country, and Oric Goldfinger somehow came to me and said, "Hey, why don't you come to Merry Old England, to Old Blighty, and uh, work for me, and we'll take you around Europe?" Yeah, I mean, they just worked for him. Like, I don't see a problem with that. Other than the fact that they're opposed to the West because they're commies. Well, yeah, I meant uh, forget it. Anyway, where were we with the story? So Goldfinger's cheating at golf. Again, he's cheating at games of chance. Actually, that's a game of skill. Golf is a game of skill. But golf is one of the great refined games. Yeah. You know, it's it's like the height of civilization. And if you're cheating at golf, you're that this big of a... This guy cheats at everything. But he's that big of a douchebag. And then you of find course. out when Bond turns the tables on him. Yes. And he... by the way, his caddy. His caddy is such a great... I love this guy. Yeah. He's in on it. He's helping Bond turn yeah. the tables. It's great. Yeah, so anyway, he shows him the gold bar, and he, what does he say? Oh, they they make a wager that whoever wins gets the gold bar. And and Goldfinger and, will stack, uh, uh, stake the $5,000, right. 5,000 pound equivalent. Right, exactly. So um, the guy's cheating, and then uh, James finds a way to, you know... Make him lose. Make him lose because it's strict rules of golf. They're strict playing rules. strict There's rules of golf. Yes, and the so, guy cheated, and he found him cheating, and then he found a way to at the end. Well, he found his original ball that he replaced. Right, and um, so he loses, and he's pissed. He's really pissed, but then Goldfinger reveals that this is the second time they've met, and reveals that I know exactly who you are, Mister Bond. Yes, and it, and so Bond is Bond has been found out. He's been found out. So. Yeah, but in the meantime, he puts a device in the trunk of his car, which can track him. Well, we did skip over. Yeah, Q, all of the cool stuff yes, we, that he got from Q and the cool car. It's loaded. also one of the great Desmond Llewellyn, who plays Q, who was in the Bond films all the way up until, I want to say, The World is Not Enough? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he spanned a long time. He was in almost all of them. And and uh, uh, maybe it's no time. To, no, I think it's World is Not Enough. Oh, no, no. It, maybe it's Tomorrow Never Dies is the last time you see Q. I forget. I'd have I, to. I don't know. But, yes, yeah, so we have the Q scene, which, which um, right before they go play golf, and he gets the DB5, the Aston Martin DB5, the classic... When I was a kid, I had a Corgi toy of the Aston Martin DB5 where the machine guns popped out, the ejector seat worked. It was the greatest die-cast car ever. Did you have one of those? I did not. Every boy, I think every kid had one of those Corgi DB5s. I didn't. That's why I'm building another one. I, I would have loved to have had one. Well, if I knew you when I was a kid, I would have let you play with mine. Yeah. That would have been awesome. But you're well, gonna... I wouldn't have played with you. You're a lot older than me, so... Oh, well, thanks. And thanks. when you're a kid, that's a huge span. I would not have played with you. Well, what did you ask me today if I would give you? <laughs> what have I been getting the parts for for the last two years? For that car. A one eighth scale Aston Martin DB5. Yeah. so build it and give it to me. It's like this big. It's really big. But I want the James Bond. I want the Sean Connery figure in the gray suit. Well, you to know, put into the car. It doesn't fit in the car. That's a one six scale figure. What the hell? Why would they make? Why would you buy a one eighth scale car when it's all big of your and... figures are one sixth? Well, because I already have a one six Batmobile. I have a, two one six Batmobiles. A one six Land Speeder. I don't care about the Batmobile. Well, I understand, but they don't make a one sixth DB five. They should. What? Why would they make it one eighth? That makes absolutely no sense. Because there are other die cast cars in the one eighth scale. They're not made for figures. Although it does light up, everything lights up. I got I got the 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 uh, rear uh, lights today, and the is, wiring. Is it remote control? 
It is not remote control. That'd be cool. I you could make it remote control if you wanted to. You could actually you could you could do that, but you'd have to take out the cool engine anyway. That's we could put like little Nerf darts for the um, for the machine guns. Like, no, it's not that big. The little Nerf darts. Anyway, we'll show it on whining about movies when it's done. I just have to get all the parts first. I'm almost done. I have almost all the parts. I just want a Zed figure. I understand, but they don't make a Zed figure, babe. Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. Aww. So anyway, so Bond Q, you get to see the Q, the Q workshop where they have parking meters that spew nerve gas, and <laughs> right. they've got raincoats that are uh, that are impervious to machine to gun machine fire. Guns. And but they're still perfecting it. They're still perfecting it. <laughs> and, and, and one of my favorite things in this movie is is Q says to Bond. It's going to take me about an hour to show you all the gadgets in this car. And he just, they cut back to Connor and he's like, ugh. Like he's heard it all before. He's like, just give me the car. Yeah. Just give me the car. So I'll figure it out. So he shows him. He's like, there's machine guns in the front and this and then this button. There's, Don't ever there's, push it. <laughs> there's an ejector seat and it's great. Ejector seat? You're joking. I never joke about my equipment, 007. <laughs> about my work. Oh, it's so great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Hashtag make a Z for Elizabeth. Thank you, Black Phillip. I'm wearing Black Phillip, by the way. I got my great shirt, my Black Phillip shirt on today. Um, so, yeah, so then Bond Bond uh, puts a little transmitter that Q's given him, slips it into the back of uh, Goldfinger's classic Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. And so Bond ends up following uh, Goldfinger to the airport. And they, yes. ship his, they ship his uh, car over to mainland, uh, the mainland of, of Europe. Right. Would you call it the mainland? I guess because you're in the British Isles and you go to the mainland of Europe. And he's they go to they, Geneva and Bond. They're not playing golf. They're not in. They're no, they in, they haven't. They're in England. Oh. They're in, or maybe Scotland. I don't know. They're in England. Okay. And then they they're in the they're somewhere. Anyway, he put he loads up his car into the airplane and then um, Bond follows him in another plane. A British plane is going to take him with over with his car. <laughs> With his car, and then they're driving in the Swiss Alps. They are they're outside oh, they of go Geneva, to Switzerland. Yeah, and so, um, they, yes, they're uh, driving in the Alps, and uh, he's following him. And then this car comes up behind him, and she's driving crazy and keeps like beeping at him and trying to swerve around him. And finally, he lets her go ahead of him. And he's tempted to follow her, but then he decides that he really needs to behave. Yeah, he needs to behave. He even says, behave, 007. Because he's going to go... I mean, what I love about 007 is, and and one of the things that appealed to me as a kid, like, I love the girls of the 60s. Yeah. Whether it was Captain Kirk or Bond. <laughs> and both men would always avail themselves of the opportunity to hook up with the pretty girls, you know. And, and they were respectful, but, you know... If well, there's one scene where he's almost rapey, almost rapey. Well, they, but we'll get to that. Yeah. And she is a lesbian after all, so. Well, not in this movie. Well, they, she was a lesbian in the book. They don't, she does say in the film, I'm, uh, save it, I'm impervious to your charms. Right. She basically comes out and says, look at dude, I'm a lesbian. Well. Without saying it. But she doesn't say it, and she does give in to his charms when he almost rapes her. But anyway, uh, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would say there she gives as well as she gets. That's la that's the, the, the farmhouse, you mean? Yeah. We'll talk about it later. We haven't yeah. got there yet. We haven't even met Miss Pussy Galore. <laughs> I mean, one of the great names of any character in human history. Yeah. Uh, so, so anyway, so Bond is following and, and he's tracking Goldfinger. Goldfinger stops at one point, uh, and the vistas are beautiful. They're in the mountains. It's gorgeous. And yeah, he stops and, and down below he sees, um, Goldfinger and they're buying peaches or something from some kids on the side of the road. And then above him, he, there's somebody shooting at him. And it's the girl, and he gets in the car, and he goes up there to see what's up. And he tracks her down. And he uses, and this is another great thing about this movie, he uses his tire cutters, these things that extend yeah. out of the... And he doesn't just pop her tires. He he destroys the entire side of her car. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you must have had a blowout. He's destroyed right. two of her tires. 
No, it, no one ever the comments. The tires were new. The, the tires were new. Nobody ever com comments on the fact that the entire side of the car has been I, chewed up. I didn't up. see that. I just saw that the whole tire, both the inner part and the outer It's not part. just the tire. It's the door. It's the whole side panel of the car has been completely Are destroyed. You sure? Yes, I'm I, sure. I don't know You about see that. it in the film. Mm, they don't mention it. I know they don't mention it, but I've always thought that was funny. That they're talking about the tires being, but she's like, what happened to this? My, the, my car was just, it looks like somebody took a, and somebody did, drilled right through the sides of it. I didn't see that. And actually the scene where the, you actually see that thing coming out and, and tearing up the tire. Yeah. And it just, it doesn't just tear up the tire. It goes all the way down the side. Yes, it does. No, that's babe. not in the scene. Yes, it is. It is. Okay. And that's why I've always Maybe. laughed about it. because know. Oh, I know it. I'll have to see it again. Anyway, it's awesome. Anyway, so then he offers to take get take her to town so she can find. He wants that. to know who do you work for. Like, why are you shooting at me? Right. And what does he find out? That that she's the sister. She's Tilly Masterson, Jill Masterson's sister. Yeah, and she wants to kill Goldfinger because her sister's dead. And she's she's equally she's more of an elegant beauty. But, I mean, Jill Masterson was clearly a party girl. Yeah. Tilly was probably went to, like, Eaton yeah. College or something, more right. refined, she but is. equally smoking hot. She is beautiful. Yeah, I would say that the Masterson family has good genes. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, and so, then what? Well, then Bond, Bond uh, takes care of her, and then Bond goes to find out what's happening, and there's Auric Industries or Auric Enterprises, right? Which is one of his facilities, smelting facilities, and uh, Bond is is reconnoitering the situation and seeing what's up, and then goes down to find out what's going on down there. Yes. And it looks like we have again it's it's his Korean guards, and he's meeting with uh, somebody who's Korean. I don't know if he's North Korean or not, but somebody he's meeting and and Goldfinger is explaining his whole production facility and you find out that his car his his rolls royce is actually the the car itself right. is how they they they, they the parts, smuggle the parts on the car were the gold that he was smuggling and then you see them taking the car apart and it's really cool gold. it is kind of it, a good idea it is really cool i mean and so bond has now solved the problem how they smuggled this stuff around and um and then he gets discovered and well, but that happens after he's caught. What happens is the the girl Tilly is shooting. She's on the premises, and she is. Well, that's at night. Yeah, yeah shooting, right. Shooting, shooting. She's she gets caught, or he finds her there. He and finds they trigger, her. It, they trigger the um, they trigger the alarm. Yes. And then all the Koreans come, the minions to um catch them and there's extended action sequences there's there's a car chase with the db5 yeah and that's when he uses all his gadgets he uses all his gadgets and it's really cool and oh until he gets killed till he gets killed with the bowler hat oh uh, odd job we didn't mention that odd job shows at the at the at the golf course that his bowler hat he can throw it and it can chop off yeah, the heads it of obviously has blades in it or something blades in it and kill people so odd job ends up killing her yeah he kills her what a dick. I mean, I think that Goldfinger owes a, a letter of apology to the Masters and family. Yeah. Two, two daughters. Wipes out. Hopefully two. they've got more daughters at home. Well, you can't replace the two that are dead. No. It's sad. But then there's a long extended sequence... And eventually the DB5 is destroyed. It crashes he into crashes a wall. It crashes into a wall. <laughs> and then, but he wakes up. Like, after all of this stuff, he wakes up. Yeah, he's strapped to a golden table. And in one of the one of the great Bond sequences ever, he's strapped to a golden table. And in his, he's heard something about what he hears, uh, Operation Grand Slam. Yeah. He's heard that as he's being carted away or whatever. And he's strapped to a golden table and a giant laser... Is slowly moving up to his peen. His peen, his peens. Come on, it, man! It's gonna cut him in half. It can't because that is Zed's package wrapped in a bow. That's true. A lot of the people watching this episode are gonna wonder who is Zed and what do you mean by it's wrapped up in a bow? That would be referring back to John Borman's 1974 film Zardoz. Zardoz. That came out a decade after this film. 
that One also stars Sean films, Connery. My favorite character ever is Sean Connery as Zed. And he's wearing a red, I don't know, what is it? Loincloth that is tied in the front like a, his package is basically wrapped in a bow. Which is ironic because in that movie, the penis, as they tell you, is it's evil. evil. The gun is good, the but penis is evil. Well, it is, well, yeah, I guess the so. The gun is good and the penis is evil, but his penis is wrapped in a bow. It's, yes. <clears throat> so anyway, that's a different movie. We have already done that movie. I know, but I love that character so much, and I love Sean Connery so much. Well, okay. And his peen was going to be lasered off, but he needed it for Zardoz. Another great scene, though, because the way Connery plays this is it's one of the only times, in the, maybe the only time in the entire Bond series where he fears for his life. You see it in his face. Like... He's playing the yeah. role like I. He's, and he's like trying to figure out how is he going to get this guy to not kill him. Right, and and because there's no way he can't fight his way out of this, he has to use his wits. But but and you see him in his mind. He's scrambling. He's panicking. He is. He's panicking, and and he comes up with something. He throws out Operation Grand Slam, for instance. Right. And and Goldfinger. What I he's love like, about Goldfinger this, is like nobody knows about that. So who cares? We're killing you. Yeah. What I love and about finally this. Finally, he's like, well, the guy after me, 008, is going to come after you, and he knows all this information, which he doesn't. But Goldfinger doesn't know that. Right. But what I love about this is Goldfinger is not stupid. He's a villain, no. like at the golf course. He says, "Well, you this can't is this. be a great villain and be stupid." Well, that's what I love about this is that Gold, is that Goldfinger is he knows and. When you see him nonchalantly toss off the fact that Sean Connery is about to be lasered in half, imagine the mess that would be. And he's just going to walk away, but then when Bond says, double away, it'll follow me, and Goldfinger's like, uh, but can you can you afford to take that chance? Right. Right. And then he decides that he needs him, so he uh, stops the laser. Thank God. Stops the laser, and then... And then he he's incarcerated, and he overhears. He basically sees Goldfinger is hosting sort of a conclave of all of these mafiosos, these kind of two-bit villains that you get the idea that all of these guys have invested in Goldfinger's operations. Right, right. They've all got they've all they've all put in money to help him accomplish. Well, they did something for him, and each one of them is supposed to get a million dollars. Yeah. Like they probably finance his operation. But this is when he gets to America. Did you already say that? No, I haven't. He, he flies to America and flies. This is when James Bond meets Pussy Galore. Yes. Because so Goldfinger flies to America, but then he puts James Bond on a plane, and the pilot is Pussy Galore. The pilot's Pussy Galore, and Pussy Galore has Pussy Galore's flying circus. Right. And they're they're flying to um, Kentucky. Yeah, Kentucky. Where where Goldfinger has a uh, he's breaking horses. He's got a horse facility, but so he meets Bond meets Pussy Galore, and Pussy Galore. That's when she says, "You know, I, I, I'm immune to your charms." Right. But um, but there is there's another hot Asian girl that's on the plane. That yeah, but she keeps spying on him. She's spying and he on figures him. Figures it out. But anyway, that's when he puts on that gray suit. Man, does he look amazing? But I guess yeah, that's when that's when that's right. That's when they meet <laughs> all the. Uh... So they get to Kentucky and they put him in a in a jail cell, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> in the basement. But it conveniently, <clears throat> he can kind of look up into. You know. Well, no, because he escapes the cell by luring the guy over that's guarding him, and he gets out. And um, that's when he notices the <clears throat> the uh, the model that has he can look through the windows and see mm. all the thugs that are in that room. And yeah. so you find out what is Operation Grand Slam, Elizabeth. So they're going. He wants to go and to um, get America's gold in um, well, Fort he's gonna, Knox. He's he going to use to go to he's going to use a nuclear device. But he doesn't tell that to the thugs. Right? No, he doesn't. He says they're going to go and get the gold in the bank. 
which is the Fort Knox. Um, which we are still on the gold standard then, so it would crush, it would destroy the economy yeah. of the United States and, and the world as well. Yeah, it would. So what I love about Goldfinger's plot is it is a world domination plot because uh, Goldfinger wants all of his gold to be worth that much more yes, money. Yeah, so the, the real plan is he's going to put a nuclear device in there and radiate all the gold, which then it would be worthless at that point and which would make his gold worth 10 times more. And then of course, uh, bond goes back and forth with pussy galore. And then basically the, the third act is all of these. It, it's leading up to the, the action sequences and, and everything and, uh, battles happen and <laughs> there's all kinds of bond shenanigans you know well he convinces pussy galore to although you don't see this until the end that to um not follow the plan right <clears throat> so she's supposed to poison everyone with nerve gas around fort knox like i mean they're gonna kill everybody they're gonna kill they're like gonna hundreds kill and everyone. hundreds of people yeah yeah like sixty thousand people they're gonna kill them so that he could, um, so he can go in and do his evil plan. And, uh, in so her, her pilots who are all these blonde girls, they're in on it. <laughs> well, I don't think, I don't know if they are. Well, no, they're helping. They're but helping. They're, they're ones flying the planes yeah. and. <clears throat> do you have COVID? Yes. Okay. And expelling all the, the nerve gas. But it's not nerve gas in the end. Right. They, they replace it. You know. <clears throat> anyway. And Felix Leiter's contacted, and, and, and there's a great battle, and, and it, it all comes down to Odd Job and Bond fighting inside Fort Knox. And by the way, Ken Adam, who designed the sets, um, they didn't know what the inside of Fort Knox looked like. So the inside of Fort Knox is a complete fabrication. And it's really cool. It is. Where they cool. have all—it's a great set. Like they these have all these open. Of gold. Yeah, it's 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 this the great huge vault. And and as a kid, <laughs> what, what whenever I'd hear about Fort Knox and you'd hear in history class how we were on the gold standard, yeah. in my mind to this day, I believe that Fort Knox looks exactly like the yeah. interior. Of Fort Knox looks of exactly it does. like with electrified bars and you know. I want those gold bars. And then, well, I want all of them too. That'd be great. And then it comes down to Bond has to defuse. I don't even have to have all of them. I could just have a small stack. Bond has to defuse a nuke, and he he stops it. He well, he's about to pull some wires, and his one of his people comes right at the last second and turns a switch off, and then it stops at zero zero seven. Zero zero seven. Saves a little the cheesy, day. but kind of cool. And then there's a tag. There's an end tag in the sort of where where uh, Bond is being flown back. And it turns out it's Goldfinger on the plane. And yeah. Pussy Galore has been forced to fly it. That's right. And they have a battle and, 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 and Goldfinger... And the gun goes off and, and then blows out a window. And then Goldfinger is sucked out the window. So, yes. And, and Bond <laughs> and, and uh, Pussy Galore wind up... Uh, they they crash land. They crash land. Or on, they 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 parachute out. They parachute out. The plane crashes and they're about to be rescued. And he tells her not to uh, yeah, we draw don't, attention. Yeah, no. And then then they wrap themselves up in the parachute. And the, yes, boom, chicka, boom, bow, and the movie ends. So let me ask you, Elizabeth, what did you think of Goldfinger? I love this movie. I I know it's I love it too. Now I, I mean. You know, the th this was a time when James Bond films were trend setting, right? Instead of following trends, right? And and I think in a way, you know, you look at the Daniel Craig movies. While I love Casino Royale, now the Bond films are a pastiche of other movies. Yeah. They're not their own thing anymore. And this was when Bond was new. Uh, they're close to they 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 close to uh, Fleming's novels. And wait, 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 wait. wait. I mean, they really set their James Bond movies are what set the trend for these kinds of movies. Oh, I know. But by the seventies, by the Roger Moore era, they were following trends. They were following black exploitation and live and let die and martial arts movies and man with the golden gun. 
And so Bond Bond was a trendsetter, and is in a way the entire franchise is a victim of its own success. It had it, its zenith, arguably, was in the '60s. You know, these films are hugely successful, and <clears throat> Sean Connery did five movies, and then he took a movie off. Our next movie tomorrow night is on Her Majesty's Secret Service with George Lazenby, which was the sixth Bond film that came out in 1969, which is actually based on, I believe, was that the first book in the I'm not, I don't remember. I'll have to do some research. But, but so Lazenby came back in 69, or came, it was, and then Bond, uh, Connery came back in 71 for Diamonds of Forever. But, but the, um, um, uh, these films were, were huge. They were, and, and there were so yeah. many, there were so many, uh, pretenders dean martin in the matt helm movies you had the our man flint films with james coburn but this was the gold standard yeah and and these were jet setting movies you know for an american population and the world population that came back after world war ii and built the american middle class in the 50s i mean this was men were now you know being getting jobs in insurance companies and providing for their families and living home lives and creating suburbia and all that seeing these films was was a huge deal oh my god i'm gonna be a i want to be a jet setting guy who sleeps with all the women i want and travels internationally and it was a whole new thing so what is it like for you to look back at this movie i mean this movie is 56 years old wow so what's it like going back i mean i know you thought some of the depictions of men were a little problematic but you still seem to be into it. Yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> no, I don't know, and nor does our audience, so you should tell them. <laughs> I mean, th this is a film in the 60s. Like, it was made in the 60s. This is how society was. and. But do you think society is better now? I think we've come a long way. But now it's like going the other, like it's a pendulum, and it's like swinging now to the other extreme. Well, now it's a weird pendulum where, where I mean, I, I think what's interesting about uh, the term thirsty, men and women can get thirsty for each other. And, um, and, and, and I think this, the world of the 60s was a very thirsty world. And yeah. now, now I think that we've lost that. You know, having having a thirst, having a desire. I mean, thirsty is more of a... Well, I mean, women weren't exactly treated equally that's not good but what we have lost which is sad is this ability to f be flirtatious with one another um you have to be very careful what you say and what you do and um you know of course we don't want anyone to be raped or taken advantage of um of course but we've lost the ability to well, in the, which was something we glossed over, the farmhouse scene, yeah, where 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 it's a seduction scene. You call it what you want. I mean, Pussy Galore gives as much as she gets. I mean, she she she. Well, it she, could have gone bad because he lands on top of her and starts kissing her, and it's like he's forcing himself on her, and she quickly accepts it. But it could have. She could have not. Right, but she does. She turns the tables on. They fight. You know, they 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 they're wrestling around. But yeah, I no, I agree with you. But I do think, I do think that there's an element of all of this. Um. I mean, obviously, people want to be treated equal, but, but, you know, James Bond is a man who at any moment can die. Yeah. And I think when I was a kid, I recognized like, part of the reason James Bond is the way he is is he is a sensualist. He drinks in life like he knows what temperature champagne, good champagne, should be consumed at. He loves beautiful women. He yeah. wants to. Well, he has to live in the moment at all times. All times. Because he could be dead the next day. Right. You know. Um, and the world could be destroyed. Yeah. Like he never knows. So, I mean, I think in a way that one of the things I admire about I've always admired about Bond movies when you're a kid. There's certainly a wish fulfillment there. I mean, he's such a cool guy, but Bond also is a sm he knows so much about so yes. many different things. He's smart, he's charming, he's handsome, he is he's you know, talented. He wears bespoke suits. Yeah. I he's mean, he's charming. got the coolest gadgets. He's 
got a wonderful accent with a cool slur. <laughs> when Cortez <laughs> made it to the New World, the he best, burned his ship. The best lip lisp ever. That way his men were properly motivated. <laughs> That's terrible. I can't do impressions. But so so you love this film. Yes, it's it's yes. I love James Bond films. They are <clears throat> very nostalgic for me. Um, they make me think of my dad, which I miss very dearly. And um, they're, they're special. They're, you know. They are special. And what's interesting to me is, is especially growing up, I mean, you're, you're younger than me, but not that much younger. And there was a time when Bond films were on TV, like, all the time. Like, my entire childhood. When, they when, were. They when, were on TV all the when time. When we had three, not like TBS, now they're on even more, but... But, I mean, when you were a kid, there was only three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And when ABC would show a James Bond movie on Sunday night, it was yeah. an event. Yeah, it You'd was. You'd get, like, three or four a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I used to have to negotiate with my parents to stay up to and stay watch up them. To stay up till 11. Yeah, I'd stay up till 11 to watch them. And it was a thing. And every kid... It was a thing. Every kid watched them. Yes. you go to school Monday and you talk yes, about... Yes, you would. Bond. And it was hugely, hugely influential. It was. And and I think, you know, the advent of cable television sort of made it less special. Like, when I was yeah. still working, uh, when I was in the movie trivia Schmodown, for the, uh, when the inner geekdom, I was the first inner geekdom champion. And I was always saying to them, you know, why isn't there a Bond category? I mean, there should be a Bond category. And they did for a while make a Bond category. And there was so much pushback. Oh, Everybody no, was nobody like, watched Bond nobody watched. Nobody knew that Bond. Point. Nobody knew Bond because Sad. if you didn't, you, if you didn't grow up, if you were not a child of, and you yeah. had to be a child of the seventies and the mid, the early to mid eighties, yeah, because then things changed with home video. It was different. It's true. So there was about a fifteen year period of time from nineteen early seventies to about eighty four, eighty five, when when Bond was like burned into the brains of, yeah. of kids yes because when they would put it on tv man we watched it mm -hmm. we watched everything because we only had three channels right right you know every movie that came on i would watch it was a big deal it like was. wizard of oz well and then you would like you couldn't pause anything you'd have to go to the bathroom during the commercials i mean you know no it was it was bad and the bond films this movie's 110 minutes long but they would show it in like a two and a half hour block of time or they even would. longer because they had to put the commercials in it. Right. So, well, listen, we have some letters from people. Oh, awesome. We have some uh, two letters <clears throat> that I will read. Um, this one comes from Jason Webster. Hi, Robert. I hope yourself, the master of Mary Discourse, the Viceroy of Verisimilitude, and Elizabeth are having a wonderful, as are all members of the one and only Post Geek Singularity, are having a wonderful... Probably a wonderful, wonderful day. Wonderful time. Wonderful day. As a fan of the Bond franchise, I'm glad you'll be watching and discussing some of the films from the franchise for whining about movies. For all of this week in Australia, the channel Gem, Channel 92, will be airing the Bond film starring Sean Connery, Dr. No, From Russia with Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, You Only Live Twice, and Diamonds Are Forever. Ha ha, they're not doing the unofficial Bond film. Never say never again. Thunderball was on last night, and I enjoyed watching it for the umpteenth time, and I never get sick of seeing it. The film is my favorite of the whole franchise, from the pre-opening title sequence and the Tom Jones silky, powerful voice belting out the theme to the closing credits. I just love the whole film. Connery was never better than in this film, and it completely owned with his charm, swagger, and effortless delivery of dialogue. He breezed through the film. The underwater sequences were a sign the producers were conscious of delivering a freshness to the series and were not afraid of trying something new. The scenes and all the others are beautifully photographed. Though it is my favorite of the franchise, I do not believe it is the best of the Bond films starring Connery. That title belongs to From Russia with Love, in my opinion. That film played as a genuine spy thriller as much as a Bond film. I agree, by the way. I think From Russia with Love is the best example, the best adaptation of Fleming's literary Bond. So why didn't we watch that? Because Goldfinger is the best of the Connery Bonds. I don't know. It is. The film... What do you mean you don't know? I, I'd have to review all the other ones to make that... The film features good cinematography, even pacing, and solid acting without the overuse of or reliance on gimmicks such as gadgets. Now, some people I consider... I gadgets. I do, too. Uh, well, that's why. Now, some people consider Goldfinger to... 
uh, to be the best of the Bond films, starring Sean Connery, and I can certainly understand why. It featured all the tropes we come to associate as classics with the Bond franchise, a flamboyant villain, cool gadgets, sexy Bond girl, exotic locales, and thrilling action set pieces. I'll elaborate a little further. Gert Froba, or is it, is it Froba? Maybe it's Frobe. Turned in a great performance as Oric Goldfinger, imbuing him with energy, charisma, and an obsession for gold that made his motivations and actions ostentatious. Pussy Galore functioned as more than your typical Bond girl, though beautiful. She wasn't a damsel in distress, and she was intelligent, charming, resourceful, and a match for Bond in their physical confrontations. Importantly... She's given more to do in the film than a lot of Bond women are given, and Honor Blackman turned in a good performance, unlike the wooden performances often associated with Bond girls. The locations from the pre-opening title sequence to the end provided a global scale, from Latin America to the United States, making Goldfinger an adventure in the truest sense of the word. Even though the oil refinery where Bond set the explosives in the pre-opening credit sequence was filmed at the Esso Oil Refinery in Stanwell, Middlesex in England. <laughs> The action sequences were thrilling. By the way, that's an optical. They go from that and they pan down. It's it's an interesting optical shot. The action sequences were thrilling, especially the car chase at Goldfinger, uh, Goldfinger's Auric Enterprises estate in Switzerland. Thank you, Robert and Elizabeth, for taking me down memory lane as this is one of the first Bond films I saw on television while growing up in Brisbane, Australia. Though Sean Connery might be gone, he'll never be forgotten as future generations will be able to be thrilled and entertained by his performance in numerous films he appeared in over the many decades. If the measure of a person is the legacy they leave behind, then what a wonderful legacy for the one and only Sir Sean Connery. To both yourself, Robert, Elizabeth, and the memorable members of the Post Geek Singularity, enjoy the rest of the week and have an amazing weekend. Sincerely, Jason Webster. What a lovely... Oh, thank uh, you. Wasn't yeah, that a great letter? That was a good letter. What a lovely letter. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, we uh, we uh, we actually have a Jeffrey Mao letter about a ma on Her Majesty's Secret Service, ah. which we'll read tomorrow. Okay. This one comes from Jared Snyder. Jared Snyder says, "Good evening, Elizabeth and Rob. I'd like to talk about the impact of James Bond, not from my perspective, but that of my parents. Mm -hmm. They went on a date to see Doctor No, leaving the children with the sitter. They wanted a movie intended for thinking adults, but also a guilty pleasure. Although it did stretch verisimilitude." Bond was not a fantasy because it stayed true to the spy genre. My parents grew up in the Great Depression and then World War II. My father survived the Romansk run and numerous North Atlantic convoys. My mother saw spouses, friends, and lovers never come back or not return whole. Although they saw the future as bright, it was tempered by their experiences, and the film highlighted both the shiny future and the shadowy forces that threatened it. Bond's gadgets were not all about the future. Miniature cam or pardon me. Bond's gadgets were all about the future. Miniature cameras, tiny tape recorders and transistor radios. Dr. No's nuclear plant was not an indictment, but a nod toward atomic energy. Couldn't Dr. No be the reason our space program had to play catch up with the Soviets? To Americans, Jamaica was an exotic British colony, even though they all listened to Harry Belafonte's Calypso records. My mother talked about the bikini. I think everyone talked about the bikini, but I'm sure she was enamored by how nicely the suave, well-toned Connery fit his clothes, too. Yes. The film succeeds in juxtaposing the real threat of nuclear war against a heady mix of hedonism, fashion, and spy drama to create something that was starting new and fresh. The way we look at these films is so different now with 50 years of spy movies full of combinations of insanely beautiful people, over-the-top villains, fantastic plots, and brutal violence. Seated in the theater on a night in 1963, it would have been 62 actually, seated in, a the seated in a theater on a night in 1962, my parents didn't need any of that. They just needed a good story well told. Warm regards, Jared Snyder. What a great letter. Nice letter, yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, you did a great job encompassing how audiences of 62, 63, and 64 looked at the Bond films, which is something that we've completely forgotten. Yeah. So, Jared, thank you for that. Now, I'm going to jump in. You guys have been sending in a lot of firing and a lot of questions here and things to say. So uh, let's go back and see what people are saying 
Um, uh, well, um, hang on. Let me find out where we are. Ah, Justin Tonner is here. Or pardon me, it's not Tonner. I always say Tonner. It's Toner. Justin Toner is here and says, Hi, Rob. The Barnes & Noble Criterion 50% off sale is back for November. I started with picking up the Philadelphia story and the War of the Worlds Blu-rays. Can't wait to see their 4K restorations. Can't wait for Bond Whining Month. Well, it's two weeks, but cheers. Yeah, you know, I know the Criterion sale's on. I, I did pretty well at the last Criterion sale. I haven't ordered anything in this one, although I would like to get the Agnes Varda uh, box set and find out if that if they're ever going to make any more of the Bergman box sets. But anyway, Star Search sends in a tip and says, Star Trek 2, 3, and 4 are a great sci-fi trilogy or the greatest sci-fi trilogy. Don't say Star Wars is better. Well, I will never say Star Wars is better as a trilogy because Return of the Jedi is one of the most disappointing cinematic experiences I ever had. But Star Trek 2, 3, and 4 do make a great trilogy, but I can't think of them that way because they weren't conceived of as a trilogy. I mean, I, mean, I guess you could say that about any. But it is definitely one of the, one of the great sci-fi trilogies. I don't know... Uh, you know, I would put up things that people don't usually think about, like the Mad Max trilogy. It's just not as beloved, but it's it's pretty great. It's pretty great. Timbula the Spider Monkey is here. Tim is here. He sends in a tip and says, Honor Blackman was in two of my top 20 movies of all time within the space of two years. Goldfinger and Jason and the Argonauts. Boy, do I love Jason and the Argonauts. That's why she was probably my first earliest celebrity crush. And with my girlfriend being Scottish, Sean will always be hers. And mine. And yours. Okay, <laughs> and yours. All right, all right. Um, Cinema Gulp sends in a super chat and says, To both of you, what do you think about Gold Member? And Elizabeth, once again, looks amazing. Oh, well, thank you. You look amazing. I tried to wear as much gold as possible. I mean, I found I wore the biggest gold earrings I have. The biggest gold earrings you have. You look yeah. amazing. Did I not well, say you looked amazing you. at the beginning? Yes, you did. I thank did. You. you, you, uh, <laughs> you, you're a very gold finger tonight. I am. Uh, well, that gold member is the third Austin Powers film. <laughs> right. Um, you know. I like the Austin Powers movies. What I do you... love the Austin Power movies. I love them. I think they're hilarious. I love comedy. And, I mean, I, they're great. They're great. I loved Goldmember. I didn't like The Spy Who Shagged Me. No. I, 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 you know, I have to rewatch them. It's been so long. Would it surprise you to know that I do have them on Blu-ray? <laughs> of course you do. Uh, just saying they're... Actually, they're right over... No, I moved a new shelf, so they're over there. Awesome. Uh, yeah, you know, I like Goldmember. The problem that I have with... Here, here's the problem I have with the, the sort of the modern day. We live in a world where all of these things that I grew up with and loved are relentlessly parodied by pop culture. Whether it's Mystery Science Theater 3000, The Simpsons, South Park. I mean, everything has been parodied yeah. for, for decades now. I mean, The Simpsons has been parodying things for 30 years almost. Yeah, and what I what I hate about that is when you try and talk about these things to people or or talk about how they, what they mean, they always will throw you lines of. I mean, even Mad Magazine did parodies of this stuff, so it's hard to explain to somebody if you really like this stuff and it means something to you. Other people will never take it as seriously because I don't think that the parodies take away from the original. It's just. But people, but people see the parodies and they have never seen the original. That's they, true. That does, and that's happen. what I don't like. Yeah, well, some people are more attracted to comedy, so I know I can't. I'm just saying. But you like I like the Austin Powers. I movie. think they're funny. The first when I saw Austin Powers, I was dying. Yeah, because it's not just Bond; it's the entire swinging London. It is. It's like blow up. It's like uh, I mean, all these other. Yeah. It, it's it's I love them. Yeah, they're pretty funny. So, I, I mean, I do. I think Goldmember, I thought Goldmember was really funny. Like, I don't remember the details of each one, so I I can't say. But I remember that I think they're hilarious. Yeah. And I would love to watch them again. We should actually do them for the, <laughs> for the maybe, show. Maybe, well, maybe, I mean, maybe not all three of them. 
But maybe we could follow up the Bond thing and do an Austin Powers movie. Like do the do the first Austin Powers okay, movie. Okay, I would love that. So that's what we'll do. So in 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 two weeks we'll we'll, do we'll, we'll our, our end when we do a Skyfall the next movie we'll do Austin Powers. So yeah, then we should do a Get Smart movie too. Then. Uh, no, I, well, okay, because the 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 gets the only Get Smart movie is the nude bomb and it's not good. Oh come on! The, the remake with Steve Carell doesn't count. No. Because if you're gonna talk about Get Smart, you've got to talk about. I loved Get Smart. I, I love Get Smart too, but it's. I mean, if you think about it, in the '60s, Get Smart was a parody of Bond. Wild Wild West was a parody I of Bond. I loved the Wild Wild West. I have. You know, I have the box set in our bedroom. Really? I, have every, I would rewatch that. I have every episode. I could not like every time it came on. I I just couldn't wait to watch it. I loved the Wild Wild West. I like Wild Wild West too. I loved it. It was science fiction and James Bond. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> it was it was Western punk. <laughs> yeah. Um, Roberto Suarez is here. Hello, sir. Goldfinger solidified the Bond formula and defined the building blocks of the franchise for decades to come. It is also the rare example of a film surpassing the source material. I would agree it's better than the book. Improving on Fleming's story in a number of ways. Rest in peace, Sean Connery. Yes. A black Philip Alvarez sends us a tip and says, Welcome back, missed y'all, <laughs> during my birth week. Well, oh, missed you too, Black Philip. Yeah. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy belated birthday. Happy, yes. Cheers to uh, Black Philip Alvarez. Cheers. Uh, Zach Losel is here. Hello, Zach. Happy to see both of you. Today I felt genuinely happy for the first time in almost four years. We're in a better timeline. L'chaim. L'chaim. Yeah, L'chaim, I mean, Zach. I was, I was resigned to four more years of torture. With plans to move out of the country. Yeah, but you know, let's hope that um, the, the divisiveness wind... that we can we can come together as Americans. Uh, oh, it's going to take time. It's, no, it, it's, it's going to take time. There's a lot of anger, and I think that that you know the the look. Donald Trump got the second most votes of any presidential candidate in history. Well, yeah, that's because we all desperately wanted our own person to win right but what i'm saying is is that the half of america th wanted donald trump like I, I explained today on my show that you know my mom voted for donald trump and i was like what you're you've been a staunch democrat your whole life and my mom's concern was she said during the trump presidency my mutual funds that i live off of have doubled in value and i said i can't argue with that and there's a lot of policies that were enacted that people uh, liked. I'm not saying I, I I'm not a fan of Donald Trump as a person. He's been a he's been in the pop culture for 35 years since I've been alive. But what we need to do is we have to concentrate and find out why did more black voters now vote for Trump this time? Why did more Why did more um, uh, LGBTQ people vote for Trump? And there are people that have real concerns, and we have to find out how can we come together as a nation. Uh, yeah. We should remember the problem is the left, and of course the far left, uh, is out of control. Well, any extreme is is not. You know, you've got the extreme right, which is scary, and you've got the extreme left, which is also equally scary. Yeah, and um, we need to we need to we need to dial it back. And I think the important thing now is that we have to come together as a country, all of us. We do. We have to that's... stop being partisan. We have to stop being. We have to find out what 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 do we all we all want great health care. You know, we all want an infrastructure that we can rely on. We want great public education for our kids. All of us want these things. We need to start concentrating on what we could all do together. Well, I don't know if all of us want those things. You don't think all of us want good health care? Um, people, people don't want... People, for some reason, have been brainwashed to think that, you know, the way things... Are with healthcare is the right way. It's it's mind blowing to me. Well, that's what I mean. We want better healthcare. We want affordable healthcare that we can all avail ourselves of. We, if we're the most the greatest country in the world and we have all this these resources, we want our all of our population, everybody, to be. But not in, everybody wants that. Well, that's that's the real problem. We should find out that's what is insane. it. What do what do people want? But that's not for us to discuss I on don't know this why you show. Brought that up, but I'm anyway. just saying. Um, 
Uh, Black Philip Alvarez says, how much for the Black Philip hoodie, Rob? <laughs> you don't have enough money. <laughs> gold bars, okay? If well, I'll tell you what. Uh, if you bars... can find me all of the big chief Goldfinger figures, if I can get the the Connery in the in the three piece suit, in the in the, uh, in the the gray suit, the Aura Goldfinger and the Odd Job, all three of them. But that's that's a lot to ask because that's Zed. that's if almost. If you could get me Zed, I will send you this sweatshirt and his other Black Philip. Is it a t shirt or a sweatshirt? What my Black Philip yeah. dark roast coffee sweatshirt? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll send you all his Black Philip paraphernalia not the horns that i made but if you if you can get me a Z, I will send you all that um a Z. even if someone made a Z, we're talking hundreds of dollars it's not a fair trade somebody made this is this t-shirt hang okay. on or the sweatshirt let me okay. let me go back i, I will to also the, paint you a painting how's that oh that there you go so the, i thought i love cool nerdy shirts that combine different things like I the think cure the and the exorcist is so weird. If they are unrelated, it's why? So why? Weird. Do you think this is weird? No, actually, I really like that. Yeah, one. because you know this famous cat. I do. Yeah, so it, look. that's a good combination, but some of the combinations don't make sense. Okay, I had somebody. The shirt I was wearing on our last show, The Exorcist with Robert Smith, the guy who wrote me said, "The reason I watch you is because you'll you'll find a shirt that has that exorcist image, but with Robert Smith from the Boys Don't Cry cover." On it. And that's what I love. That somebody thought of that, and that's why I get these things. But I mean, see, I thought this, this is was... related because it's a a chat noir, which is a black cat, and then this is Black Philip, so it makes sense. I I know, but it's also But the Exorcist and and then the Smiths, it just doesn't make sense. Okay. You know what though? It, I think What's the connection? Because Robert Smith, if there was anybody that could exercise demons from a, uh, it would be the, it would be Robert Smith of the Cure. No, that, that, that doesn't make sense. It was just great because that look the fact that somebody looked at that image and it's the perfect angle. If you see that, you know he's all back. He, but it's, there's no relationship. Okay, you're. I think you're overthinking it. I overthink everything. Um. Anyway. Uh, uh, Bob Korzak is here. Bob Korzak says, not getting political, but what did you both think of tonight's festivities? I have not watched, we didn't watch Biden's speech. Biden gave a speech tonight. Yeah, we were watching uh, Goldfinger. <laughs> we were watching Goldfinger. Yeah, I, I, here's the thing. Again, what I think that we need to do is we need to, all of us, we need to find out, we need to dig deep and realize that we are all Americans and that we are all defined by the, the foundational documents of this country that were written by people that are now declared perhaps problematic, but their ideas were sound, and they created one of the greatest, the greatest democracy, a new idea that had never worked, and I think we have forgotten who we are as people. And I hope that we, we can come together and put it away all of our divisiveness and move forward together and create... Uh, a great, you know, Donald Trump's slogan was was "Make America Great Again," but I just didn't see a lot of that happening during his presidency. He did not step up the way John Kennedy did and inspire people. We will go to the moon in this decade, he said. Decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. N don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country, and I think that's where we are right now. What can we do for our country and what can we do for each other? And and that's what I would like to see. I mean, you know, there's one thing I know about the American population is that if there's a problem or a concern, people will come together and help solve that problem locally. If you're like, if somebody, you know, you can look at if somebody has a health care problem, they put up a GoFundMe campaign, people will donate to it. Um, there's a, a science fiction writer that I've been Facebook friends with for a long time who had identity theft. He got his, his money all cleaned out and they were going to lose their house. And within a couple of days, everybody chipped in fans of his and were able to help them. And I think, you know, Americans are able to do that. What we can't do is seem to help one another, you know, you know how we think or, or we need to learn how to talk to each other. Yeah. The whole premise, the whole basis of this channel is that every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. 
And I think we've forgotten to do that. Yeah. We've forgotten to listen to everyone's stories and realize we're big country. My mother has different concerns than me. All she wanted to know is that the money that she has left in her life is going to last her for the rest of her life. Her mutual funds doubled in value during the Trump presidency, which means in her mind, I don't want it to change. Right. You know, I voted for Trump. I can, I can get behind her. I'm like, I understand why you did that, mom. Good for you. Because I, I don't want, I want the stock market to stay up that high too. But we'll see. Anyway, I don't mean to get political. So, Rob, I don't know. I, I, I need, I know, I need to know more. I, I need, I, I need to be in Starship Troopers. Do you want to know more? Yes, I do. Uh, Joseph John's here. Hail Liz and Rob. I found my Sean Connery Laserdisc collection yesterday, oh, and I watched this on that format. This is my no favorite way. Bond. I am now embarking on the rest of the collection. I have the original Star Wars trilogy on Laserdisc. Han shot first. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Can I get it? I can't reach it. It's such a mess in here. Well, yeah, I was. I would show you. I have the very first Japanese special edition of... of you've seen it. I've shown it. Anyway. Um, uh, cheers, guys. Well, congratulations. Do you have the Criterion Goldfinger? Because Criterion released a Laserdisc... I think it was gold. it was from Russia with Love and Goldfinger that was critical of people and they had to pull it. They had to pull it, so it was a bummer. Jeff Hill is here. Jeff Hill says, after Craig's Bond, do you want the next Bond franchise to go back to its pulpy roots, kind of like Kingsman, or follow the darker, realistic tone of the Daniel Craig Bonds? That's a really good question, mm. Jeff. What do you think? <sighs> See, Kingsman to I, me is too I... goofy. It's too over the top it's it's not it's not set it's it, it's 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 not a parody but it is I a no i really liked kingsman i i kind of like the idea of i like kingsman too yeah i mean yeah i would like to see more along those lines personally i have a controversial opinion i think james bond's time is over as much as I like the franchise, I honestly think that this was a series that the essence of it was born out of the Cold War, and it worked best when we were still in the midst of that. You know, Fleming was writing in the 50s, the 60s were still dealing with yeah, that. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I, I just think, I think, I think sometimes franchises, their time is over. And I think with the with No Time to Die, the 25th Bond film, someone's going to always make James Bond movies. But I think now, if you're going to do Bond, you have to completely reinvent the franchise. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would want to see more Bond. I'm just sentimental that way. I would be sad for it to be over. Well, yeah, me too. I mean, I've been watching James Bond movies literally my whole life. My entire life. I mean, as you know, I flew to London uh, in 2012 to see Skyfall. And I love James Bond. But I also think that the problem is, is that the essence of James Bond has sort of been lost. Like, to me, these early Bond films are, are pure Bond, pure uncut Bond. And we're seeing these franchises. What's happening is whether it's Star Trek or Doctor Who or Star Wars or Bond, these long-running franchises, the creators that get a hold of these franchises are trying to make them relevant for today. Yeah. But the origins of these franchises are not of today. Well, they came out of a... grow and change and evolve and... Right, but these are, know. these are, you can do that, but what you're doing is then you are, you, the filmmakers, the creators are then taking it upon themselves to change the very essence. That's okay with me. Is it? Yeah, it is. Really? Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. But if you change the essence too much, is that thing the same as it was when it was conceived? It doesn't have to be the same. As long as it's changing as it's as it's going as time is going on. Um I'm sure if you compare Dr. No with the latest film, of course, the difference is going to be huge. But if you've gone along with every single film and it's just been evolving as it goes along, I don't see a problem with that. Well, I would say if all of the films were great, 
the problem is so many of the films have not been great and have been compromised because they're trying to keep up with the times and in trying to keep up with the times that like i'll give you an example quantum of solace even though the the film isn't entirely successful they tried to edit the film like a born movie yeah. it wasn't shot like a born movie so the movie's I like Quantum of Solace, but it's borderline incoherent because the way they edited the film, they're trying to follow the Bourne films and they weren't being yeah, true to themselves. They probably shouldn't have done that. I agree. Um, but that doesn't mean that that they shouldn't keep trying to continue with this the, the franchise. I think people love it and um, want to see more. No, it's true. And it does have to change because, you know, we're changing. I, I just think the, the real problem with the Bond franchise is that the world that Bond operated in has now changed. Yeah. I mean, we are we are post 9-11, and James Bond did not stop the World Trade Towers from falling. And if we live in a world where that has happened, uh, I, I think that Bond's legitimacy, in a way, comes into question because... You know, he, he is no longer the protector that he used to be. We live in a world of asymmetric warfare. But in we, the world of James Bond, the towers weren't attacked, so... Right, but but in the... in Yes, but in the Daniel Craig Bond films, they were. In Casino I Royale... I, well, no, you don't know that, but they're movies that were made in a post-9-11 okay. world. And so... When, when, you, when you have asymmetric warfare where, where the villains of the world are not glamorous rich people that are building undersea cities or you know you're you're dealing with 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 the taliban that are hiding in caves in afghanistan that are financed by by uh uh whether it's iran or bad actors does james bond need to go after the taliban is that what we want to see in a movie and the problem with james bond is he's larger than life he, he's he's supposed to give us a world even the world bond lives in we no longer approve of. Um, I mean, that's why, back to this question, yeah. I think going back to a more Kingsman style would get away from having to immerse it in this dark reality that we're in. But even the Kingsman is playing off of the Bond franchise. It's... it's. Yes, and the question is, should, should Bond be more like that film or be more like but the then, Craig films. But then both the Craig... As they continue on. The, yeah, and I, I think... But but I don't think we want the Bond films to follow in any... We want we don't want the Bond to be... Bond films well, following... No, King. I mean, not copying exactly, I but... think the Bond films, if they're going to be reinvented, they have to recreate their own paradigm. They have to yeah. become something that is unique to Bond. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, Yes. That's why I love that's you. That's what I would... Cheers to us. That's what I would want to see. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, Jeff, a great question. Uh, Michael Preston says, Hi, Rob Elizabeth. Hi. <laughs> I'm sitting here watching you on my 100-inch screen. <laughs> oh, shit. Damn Hairs Blue, my favorite Bond film, Man with... Oh, wait. Damn Hairs Blue, my favorite Bond film is The Man with the Golden Gun. But this was great, too. Apparently, you're drinking as well, which I approve. <laughs> but, Michael, I can't believe you're watching us on a 100-inch screen. I'm uh, like, what does that mean? Ah! What does that look like? I'd love to know. Don't look at my pores. Yeah, I mean, that, that's got to be amazing. <laughs> Congratulations for having a 100-inch screen. I love that you have a 100-inch. Uh, is, is that, that a, that's making me, like, Does that mean you've got a projector or if you actually have a 100-inch screen screen? I like the thought of people watching us either on their phone or on their computer. On their their, phone? On their laptop, because then I feel like you you don't see, like, the details of my, you know. Wow. (laughs) Well, all right. So stop doing that, please. (laughs) Uh, Aeon sent in a super chat and says, Bond plus Star Trek equals DS9's Our Man Bashir. That is true. Uh, DS9 is a great Bond episode, and Our Man Bashir is great. I was in total bliss watching that awesome episode. And what what are you watching right now, Elizabeth? Star Trek. Deep Space Nine. You're in the third yes, season. I'm in the third season. Our Man Bashir comes later, but you're going to get to that. It's great. 
Thank you for that, Michael. A 200 watt studio sent in a super chat and said, what is she saying? She's saying some people don't want affordable health care or that some people disagree on the path to that. Clarify, please. Okay. Well, I mean, my family's French, so they have socialized medicine and I see how wonderful their medical system is there. And they have, they have, they are top of the line medical care. Like they have, um, treatments there that are far beyond what we have here. I know. So the excuse that if we have socialized medicine, that our medicine won't be as good is, is bullshit basically in my opinion. Well, and people <clears throat> fighting that like, it's like, it's our basic right to have health care. Oh. And so it really makes me upset when people are like, Oh no, we can't do that. Right. Uh, well, my yes. father, my father died because he did not want to go to the hospital when he was having a heart attack because of the cost. So yeah, I, it makes me very upset. Well, well, wait, hang on a second. I just want to point out, I just want to point out, um, um, uh, the question is, uh, wait, oh, oh, so some people don't want affordable health care. No, we want affordable health care. We, yes. we want basically we want socialized medicine. I mean, that's I, I agree. I think socialized med in this country. Why do we pay so much money for military? I mean, we need our military, but we're not using our military. We're spending incredible amounts of money. The military industrial complex like Eisenhower warned about. We should be spending half what we spend on the military and use the other half for health care. I mean, yeah, it's because it's a basic human right. One of the biggest problems, I think, in our country right now if if it were up to me the things that we're falling behind on is our national security relies on our intelligence a smart educated population and a healthy population and we don't have either one of those things we don't have no, we don't we don't have great public education we used to teaching for the test no we need arts programs we need music programs we need sports programs so people can diversify and we need the kind of education that we don't have anymore we used to have it when i was growing up we don't have it anymore that's true and we need people to not worry about health care yes that that's that's what our tax dollars should go for those things it really should and the thing is socialized medicine doesn't mean mean socialism yeah, I'm it not means that we're all... we should become a communist country. Like, that's insane. Or even uh, a social... Marxism has never worked. No, it has never worked. It has never worked. But when it comes to health care, like, every, every American has the right to be healthy and be cared for. Well, the problem is our health care system is for profit. It, yes, and, that's and, the and when it's for profit, that means every decision that's ever made is never for the benefit of the patients. It's only for the benefit of the entities that are providing the health care. Yeah. And and that's that's a philosophical difference. And the fact is, in America, sometimes you shouldn't always be worried about profit. When it comes to health care, uh, it should be a basic human right. Yeah, and only the rich can, can be healthy in this country. Yeah. Because if you're poor, you're fucked. Um, Justin, Justin Toner, uh, why do I say, oh, yeah, that's right, Justin Toner says, despite some technical difficulties, the Richard, Bunyan, Snipe, and I rewatched Goldfinger on another Zoom watch party the other day and had a fun time. This Bond film was one of the first I ever watched, and it has a special place in my heart. Cheers. Well, thank you, Justin. And I want to thank, let's uh, give it up for the Richard and uh, Bunyan Snipe, part of my crack team of moderators <laughs> that make these things possible if you want to get involved in a watch party for anything or just go over to the post geek singularity facebook page or the whining about movies facebook page and find any of our moderators find the richard he will hook you up with a watch party uh michael preston sends in a super chat and says i also want to say thank you for keeping me sane my wife's in the hospital oh man nothing too serious mm -hmm but needed some normalcy or norm normalcy. So love to you both and thanks. Well, Michael, Aww. let's raise a glass to your wife. Yeah, First of all, to you well. for being a good husband, but here's to your wife. And I feel guilty now that we're gonna take a, a swig of this delicious wine, but we are doing it for a good, a good cause. Yeah. So thank you, Michael. By the way, special uh, mention to Michael Preston's wife. Now, Miss Preston? I don't know if you're progressive and you didn't take your husband's last name. I'm going to assume that you did. I think the two of you 
When you get out of the hospital, the two of you should watch a James Bond movie together and collectively write a letter to this show and tell yeah. us which Bond film you watched and why you liked it. Uh, I wish you all the best, a speedy recovery, and get out of the hospital, come home to your husband, because clearly he has nothing better to do than watch this show, because <laughs> you're not home with him. Um, so get home soon. Uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk sends in a super chat and says, the political left and right need to just bang already. <laughs> Yes, that would solve everything. That would pretty much solve pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a yeah. lot of problems that will be solved there. 200 Watt Studio sends in another super chat and said, I was just going to mention the CAV Bond laser discs with the band commentaries. I love them. I had to search them out. Good stuff. Yes, people have put those commentaries up online. They are really cool. And uh, they're pretty funny. Uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk uh, says, Peace by getting yourself a piece. Best solution. <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, Bob Korzak is here and sends in a super chat and says Rob I have to tell you and I'll write you more I've been tied to Bond since I was a kid because my dad was actually a spy and it sucked well what? I would love to hear that if your for dad... real? for real? well that's what he says why wouldn't his dad... I mean there's people that are spies oh that is so freaking cool that is so well apparently it sucked yeah I'm sure it sucked for, for the kids yeah. But still, that's... Wow. Uh, David Street says, Do you think it would be for the best if Star Trek Picard does not come back for a second season to save some of Jean-Luc's legacy? Um, honestly, I I hope that they never... I, I can't tell you. I thought Star Trek Picard was one of the worst things that ever happened to the Star Trek franchise. I think that everything about it was ill-conceived. The idea behind it was was a good one, bring back Jean-Luc Picard, but the story they chose to tell and the way they told it was an affront to everything Star Trek. I think it destroyed the character of Jean-Luc Picard. Oh, yeah, the, one of the greatest Star Trek characters ever. I, I it, was a, it was a complete... I, look, I think all of Star Trek since 2009 has been a bastardization of the franchise, and uh, I won't get into it here. But, yeah, I mean, I would love it if they never made any more. They killed Picard. Picard is no longer Picard. He's dead. Jean-Luc Picard's dead. Now we have an android facsimile of him. And if you watch the episode from the very first season of the original series in 1966, What Are Little Girls Made Of? You will see why that is the fucking worst idea ever. You know why? Because Picard is no longer human. And, and Picard was... Of all the souls I've encountered in my travels, his was the most human. That's Kirk doing his box. But they, they, the fact that that's how that show went, terrible. I, I, it just god awful, horrible awfulness. Um, a two hundred watt studio sends another super chat and says, "I wasn't trying to be argumentative. I just wanted to know." I don't mean to upset you. I apologize. No, you didn't oh, upset us. Oh, my God. I'm not upset at you. I'm just upset at the system. Oh, no, no, no. Don't don't feel bad. No, not at all. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, Sean M. sends in a super chat about the Harry Palmer films. How about the Harry Palmer films? Funeral in Berlin, in my opinion, is better than most of the Bond films. I love the Harry Palmer films. Michael Caine plays a character that's similar to Bond. Oh, uh, I love I, I love Funeral in Berlin. I love Billion Dollar Brain too. Oh, I've watched that. And uh, it's it's they're, they're good. I mean, I think the Harry Palmer movies, but weren't those, if memory serves, based on books too? I'm not sure. Again, Matt Helm was based on books. That doesn't mean I don't know what I'm saying. It doesn't mean anything. They can be based on books, but that doesn't mean they're good. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I I like the Harry Palmer uh, books quite a lot. Uh, a white walker who voted sends in a tip and says, Connery is on video talking about hitting women. Surprised to see on such a progressive show that he is still praised. One can only deduce that Russia must have manufactured the video of Sean suggesting such, such a thing. Wait, what? Well, in real life, yes, he talks about, he makes a crack about hitting women on a, I mean, he hits women in this movie. <laughs> yeah, he uses her as a shield. And and I, I would ask you. So wait, wait, I don't understand. He was he actually hit women in real life. He 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 made a comment about if 
women basically get out of line. Sometimes they need to get slapped. Oh, I, he never really slapped. Also, his last wife, I mean, he was married to her for decades. Yeah. I mean, here's here's the thing. That's just a dude. Do you think say. that Sean Connery's entire life and legacy should be pilloried by a comment he made in one interview? He was trying to be funny. And well, I don't know if he was trying to be funny, but he, he, cool. I, I mean, and and should he be pilloried for a comment he I made? Have, I'd have to hear that. I want to now. I'm going to look that up. Mm. But, but so this is a progressive show. Yes, I think this show is going to stand, uh, and we will stand for Sean Connery and praise a man's life. Nobody is perfect. And the idea that one comment he made in one interview should be a reason why you cancel a man's legacy yeah. 50 years in Unless film... Unless he's actually hitting women, but I don't... I've never heard that he did. Look, I mean, the man had a successful marriage for a very long time, and I think that this is this is one of the problems with where our country is at right now cancel culture the idea that you want to erase somebody's legacy of all of the work they've done because they make one interview comment that that is something that that this is problematic this is problematic because we've all done things in anger we've all had things taken out of context and i would say that look should anybody hit anybody no they shouldn't um but i think that you know if you look at these films sean connery literally there's so much what would be called misogyny in in these films. Do people believe that now? No. But people are also products of the time in which they live. Are you going to go back and and uh, you go back far enough in time? Everybody was a victim of somebody else. And I think what's really important is how do we move forward? How do we consider? You know, we learned from the legacy of of everyone that came before us. Is the Declaration of Independence... When, when or is did a, he say that? Like what? Oh, like in their 70s. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, no, but now... Unless he's actually hitting women. Well, that's the thing. Is he an abuser? I don't think so. You know, and I, I think a progressive show that he is still praised... Sean Connery will always be praised yeah. on, on, on this channel because his legacy as an actor has enriched humanity. Has enriched all of us if he has personal beliefs that perhaps don't jibe with yours understandable but his legacy all the way back to the early 50s when he was on television all the way up to well unfortunately league of extraordinary gentlemen do you want to tarnish a man's life because of one comment he made in an interview next time one day someone's going to come for you because of something you said and you're going to be like, bah, but I didn't mean that, or oh, wait, I was being funny, or whatever. Uh, I would, I would uh, stand, t and, and look, that doesn't mean, life is complex. You know, people yeah. do, do and people things. people change, and people, you know, say stupid things that they don't really mean. And, you know, you never, you never know, and that was the 70s, and I don't know. But by the way, let me just say something. I mean... It's like, you and know, unless there's proof that he was actually hitting women. His last marriage lasted for a very long time. And by all accounts, he loved his wife. And and see, this is my this is my problem. This is why the country is so divided, because we've lost our sense of common sense. Yeah. And and um, one can only deduce that Russia must have manufactured the video. No, Sean suggesting such a thing is is. Do you really think that Sean Connery believes that it's it's okay to hit women all the time? You know, I don't think he really does. And I'll tell you, times change. We live in a we live in, we live in a country that had slavery for 400 years. 400 years. Now, are we going to pillory all the people that grew up in those 400 years that had slavery as something that was going on? Slavery is horrific. There's slavery going on right now on this planet. And the thing is, what we need to do is realize that we're in a constant, we're in a continuum that's constantly changing. And if we're going to suddenly hold people accountable to something they said 40 years ago, our entire justice system is based on the fact that if you go to jail and serve your time, when you come out, you've paid your debt to society. I mean, we, 
we have to start we have to start living a life where or 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 acting the way uh, understanding that people are not they are imperfect beings and we can't expect perfection from everybody all the time and one comment that Sean Connery made by the way in a public interview he said it publicly to a reporter and it's like he felt comfortable enough doing it now but or doing it then but now we're going to come back and be like well so Sean Connery should be what canceled like all of the great work he did should be swept aside because he made one comment on an interview yeah yeah that's um you know unless we start leading our lives and understanding what common sense is if everybody wants to get incensed about one we are lost as people I heard a great Sean Connery story that is I can't repeat on this channel. <laughs> what? You'll I have can't to tell me. I can't repeat it. <laughs> and uh it's a very funny story. I can't say it on this channel. Then why'd you bring it up? But what I wanted to say is a lot of people would say this story was not kosher. When I heard this story, I know that a lot of people would not like it. But it was damn funny. And that the way that Sean Connery said it, I'm like that's hilarious. Now, I understand that what Sean Connery was really saying, uh, he was being truthful, but he also was playing into the question that he was asked. And, you know, I, I, I think it's really important that it's funny. People would rather hang on one comment somebody made in an interview and call it problematic and want to destroy that person's life rather than looking at 50 years of their work. And I think... I, I I always would would uh, go with the fifty years. Yeah, I agree with that. So for sure. But and we are still a progressive show. But by the way, um, a White Walker who voted, I would like to say, uh, I would like to say that I do appreciate you asking the question. I think it's an important question to ask, and I thank you for asking it. And I hope you continue to watch the show. And um, I think that th that's what this show is about discourse and, and opinion many white walker voters tipped again and who started cancel culture hopefully the rule of law still applies in america and that chick from the south with her dragons won't show up <laughs> um yes i agree i agree with you wholeheartedly i think that these are all quite the, the, the point is is that we can have these yeah. these questions and we can talk and without getting totally angry and I think it's important. And I want to say, don't stop asking those questions because I think it's important that we always address these issues. Uh, 200 Watt Studio sends in a super chat and says, common sense is no longer common. 100% spot on, Rob. Well, I appreciate yeah. that. Look, the <laughs> philosophy of this entire YouTube channel is every single person you meet has a story to tell or an opinion that you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is listen. And that's what I think we need to do, is listen to people. Yeah. By the way, this show's gone on for two hours. You're kidding. No. This is a two-hour show, babe. <laughs> Nicely done. Oh, Aww. two hours. We're going to end this show, but we are coming back tomorrow night. We are. To talk about George Lazenby in what? Her Majesty's. On Her Majesty's. On Her Majesty's. On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Secret Service. I knew that. George Lazenby, his one turn as James Bond from 1969. I've seen it once. Directed by Peter Hunt, who is the editor of the Bond franchise, who stepped up. A lot of innovative filmmaking going on in this film. Very cool. One of my favorite Bond movies, I will say. And it has one hell of a goofy plot, but I love this film. <laughs> I mean, of all the Bond films that need to be parodied, this is the one... This is the most Austin Powers of all the Bond movies. <laughs> and it's also one of the most poignant and one of the most emotional Bond films that has some of my favorite people in it. And we're doing it tomorrow, so join us. Join us. Very cool. And I want to give a shout-out to our moderating staff, our great moderating staff, Joshua Levesque. We the... haven't rated the film yet. Oh, right, but I still Are want... Are we not rating it? We're rating it, but hang on. Uh, MC Black Cap, Joshua Levesque, The Richard... James Robinson, who's a member, Black Philip Alvarez. Uh, I think we're all good. Um, I think I've said everybody that's here. I think everybody's, I, I mentioned everyone. Uh, our moderating staff is great. And again, look up the Richard. I don't, I don't have any. Oh, wait. I got one little splash of wine. So, yes, we come to our 
Bottoms up scale. A bottoms up scale. Or bottoms up from one to four glasses. One to four glasses of wine. Why one to four glasses of wine? Because there are four glasses in a bottle. The way we drink? Come on. The way we drink, there's one for me and three for you. <laughs> well, that's only because you've asked me about that. I'm happy to, you know, continue to. I, I just said I only want one glass. I yeah, didn't mean did. for you to re drink the rest of the bottle, but hey. Well, anyway, so Elizabeth Goldfinger, Goldfinger. Guy Hamilton, 1964, classic Bond. What would you give it on a scale of one to four glasses of wine? I'm going to give this three glasses of wine. Three? Three and oh, a half. Oh, no, 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 three no. Three and a half. No, no, I don't want to twist your arm. That's no, not fair. No, no, because Stick I didn't know what to rate it. Stick to your... What do you mean you didn't know what to rate it? I didn't... It? I, and it's Sean Connery. I love him, so I'm going to do... I'm going to do three and a half. Okay, three and a half. I give this movie four stars. Oh. I think, as Roberto Suarez says, this is a defining... This film defined the franchise. Third time was a charm. Not that Dr. No. Yeah, see, it's because I don't remember all the other films. I haven't seen them since I was a kid. Mm. So it's hard to, you know, I wait understand. When, when I remember watching the films, but I don't remember exactly what the stories are. Well, to so, that end. Yes. I give it go. four stars. You give it three and a half. <laughs> Cheers to that. Let's drink to that. And tomorrow, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. On Her Majesty's Secret yeah. Service. That's three glasses. The longest, but well, one of the longest Bond movies. I think one of the Daniel Craig movies has ex exceeded the Bond film. Oh, yeah. I think. How long is it? Uh, it's like two and a half hours, and Bond wow. gets married. What the? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, you don't remember. I don't remember. Oh boy, you're gonna oh, 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 oh. one of the most perhaps the most shocking Bond film of all. Okay. So we have all the time in the world, time enough for life to unfold all the precious things love has. That's my. You sound like Yoda. No, that's that's my Louis Armstrong. I know it's Louis Armstrong, but you sound like Yoda. Really. Yeah. Yoda's yeah, yeah, that's Yoda. No. We have all... All right, I'll, I'll work on Yoda. that. I'll work on that for tomorrow. <laughs> all right. Imagination connoisseurs, we're bringing this episode number 92. What the hell? 92. 92. 92 to an end. Wow. We've got we've got another five Bond films in front of us. Yes, So we do. for those of you who don't know, we're doing On Our Majesty's Secret Service. On uh, Sunday, on Tuesday, we are doing The Spy Who Loved Me, Roger Moore. On Thursday, we are doing um, The Living Daylights. On Saturday, we are doing GoldenEye. And a week from Monday, we are concluding with Skyfall. Indeed. And then apparently on when on, uh, or on Tuesday, we're doing Skyfall. And then on the following Thursday, we're doing... Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. So there you go. <laughs> yes, there's the are. there's the schedule for the first half of November. November. So take us out. Everyone you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is, is listen. listen. And with that, we say... Have a better night. Have a better night, everyone. Thank you very much for all the great support of the channel. Much appreciated. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow on Her Majesty's Secret Service. <laughs> we have all Yoda. the time in the world.